Welcome to today's edition of Magazines Canada's Ad Webinars, Strategies and Tools for Overcoming Ad Blocking with Brian Kane, co-founder and CEO of SourcePoint Technologies. Slide's not moving. Over the course of this one-hour webinar, you'll learn more about the issues of ad blocking and its impact on your business, and take away strategies to combat this potential threat, some would call it an existential threat, to revenue and to improve your ad effectiveness. Um, you'll no doubt have questions for Brian Kane throughout the seminar, and he invites you to ask away. Um, as questions come to mind, simply type them into the chat box that appears on your screen. And the process will be, I'll read your questions aloud, and Brian will answer them throughout the presentation. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, a little bit about me, your moderator for the seminar. Uh, for the past four years, I've been a publishing and marketing consultant specializing in print and digital magazine strategy. Uh, prior to that, for 25 years, I have been um, an active publisher and uh, brand marketer. Uh, some of you may know me from uh, my role as publisher of Toronto Life and vice president group publisher for the magazines and websites at St. Joseph Media and the Urban Group. Uh, and also a former chair of Magazines Canada. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Brian Kane as our keynote speaker. Brian is the co-founder and chief operating officer at SourcePoint, a company providing ad blocking solutions through technology, and one that's been taking a lead role in encouraging publishers to have an open dialogue with readers about the, the transaction that takes place when they consume content. Um, he has a uh, wealth of experience in the um, digital world, uh, and uh, you can see from the um, detailed slide uh, his background, including working in his roles at DoubleClick um, and at Google. So we can see that he's bringing um, a wealth of experience to the, the uh, knowledge base today about ad locking. I'll turn that over to Brian now to take you through the session. And uh, just a reminder, please feel free to ask questions as you would like. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to uh, dive right in. Um, as mentioned, I'm Brian Kane. I've been in the advertising technology space for the last uh, 16 or 17 years. Um, and with large companies, with small companies, uh, but most recently uh, started uh, SourcePoint uh, approximately a year ago. Um, as a result of feedback we were hearing from uh, web publishers uh, about the challenges that they were facing with respect to ad blocking. At the time, it was a relatively, um, relatively low on the radar, I guess you could say, in terms of uh, the press and the media, um, the coverage of ad blocking. And what's happened over the last year has been uh, fairly dramatic in, in terms of how that has picked up. Um, so for today, uh, I'm going to really do two things. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to provide some background uh, on the ad block landscape, including a little bit of history and, in some cases, philosophy on, on how we got to this, this point where ad blocking is so prevalent. And then I will also speak about how publishers are addressing the challenges associated with ad blocking. Um, one thing to note is when I do sort of go through those, those ways that publishers are addressing the challenges, there will be definitely an emphasis on source point solutions. But be very clear, this is not any sort of veiled sales pitch. I'm not a salesperson. Um, it is a very new and evolving space. And frankly, there are very few companies with any solutions to ad blocking. So when we talk about what publishers are doing from a solution standpoint, it makes sense for us to talk about our suite of, 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 of offerings. But again, the intent here is not to sell. It's really more to educate and engage in, in dialogue. 
Uh, and then, honestly, along the way, as well as at the end, would really like uh, as much as possible for it to be um, a dialogue and there should be open questions as much as that is possible when you know all 35 participants are on mute. But we'll, we'll give that a shot anyway. Um, as I think uh, Sharon mentioned, just uh, if you have questions along the way, just stop us, put some notes in there, and we'll do our best to make it uh, interactive, uh, as interactive as possible. Um, so first, a little bit about SourcePoint. We launched last year. Um, we're a fairly global company for, an, for a very new company. We've got offices in New York, Seattle, Berlin, and, and London. What's really interesting when we start talking about Adblock is that it is not uh, a North American, a U.S., a Canadian uh, challenge primarily right now. We have seen far greater challenge outside of North America. Um, Germany, for example, has really been on, on, the, on the battlegrounds of, of the Adblock battle, for example. So we have folks in, in, in those locations who are talking to publishers and talking to, to customers, if you will. Um, we raised our first round of funding last year. We're 23 employees at this point and growing. And the, the piece I would emphasize on this slide is the leadership team, um, not because we're, we're patting ourselves on the back that we've worked for great companies, but when we talk about the space, the ad block space, we come from a very uh, specific set of experiences in advertising technology that we feel allows us to speak intelligently and with, uh, with context uh, in a way that, that takes into account the last you know, 20 years or so of digital advertising. So that's why we include it there, especially with respect to this sort of knowledge sharing session. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. You know, maybe the first thing we'll talk about here is, is what, what is Adblock? Um, if we were in the room, I would ask you to, to raise your hands if you've installed Adblock, and I, could, I would guess that in, in a room of 40 people, potentially 5 to 10 will have installed it, sometimes as high as 20, you know, 50% of the, the audience will have installed it. Um, I can't say for sure what, what that would be here, but Adblock software is quite simply just a, it's a little sort of browser plugin um, in some in most cases that gets installed in your web browser. So if uh, if you're at your computer and you're surfing the web on whether it's Safari or Google Chrome, AdBlock is a tool that gets installed in that browser, and once it's installed, it prevents advertisements from appearing on uh, in your browser. It's a really simple thing. Um, it takes approximately, uh, I've timed it, somewhere in the 8 to 10 second range to install. And once it, it's installed, you literally see virtually no ads ever again on the Internet. Um, while it is, um, in some cases, great for consumers in terms of a, a less cluttered browsing experience, um, clearly the, the ad block uh, the growing use of Adblock presents a major challenge for publishers who rely on advertising revenues uh, to, to run their respective operations. There are two things that I want to highlight here in, that, um, in the bullet list here. The first is that Adblock Plus, um, Adblock tools in general, sit on top of an open source community of users who contribute to the list of um, items that are blocked via ad block, meaning that there's not, there's not one individual, one company that is responsible for ad block um, effectiveness. It is a distributed universe of open source uh, community members who contribute and have been, um, who are passionate about sort of this ad-free notion of the Internet. And the last bullet point, I, I will highlight that as well, which is that while sometimes ad block software companies speak of themselves um, as doing, um, doing work for the greater good, an altruistic approach to keeping the Internet clutter-free, um, it is, in, in, at least in the case of Adblock Plus, one of the largest uh, software companies in the ad block space, they are a for-profit business uh, that generates revenues um, from enabling certain advertisements to pass through the ad block software. 
ads that meet their acceptable ads criteria. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of time it, it's, it's talked about as being sort of software for the greater good, but there's also a high, high level of profit motivation that, uh, that these companies operate with. So very important to understand that that is what we're talking about when we're talking about ad block. Um, in a moment, I'll talk about some other things that have come into play outside of these browser extensions. But for right now, that's a really healthy way to, to frame the, the conversation. Um, what is really uh, amazing to see is just how large the ad blocking problem um, is. Um, by some estimates, in 2015, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $22 billion um, of revenue was taken out of the ecosystem as a result of ad blocking software. Um, there's been a lot, of, a lot written about that number. It might be inflated uh, to some extent, but I will tell you it's, it's, it's not much less if, if it's anything less. So it's really significant. Uh, almost, yeah, I think 200 million or so um, people are using ad blocking software across the globe, and it's growing. Uh, approximately 40% growth uh, over the past 12 months, uh, and you could see um, the, the numbers, how it varies in the U.S. and the U.K., but generally speaking, it is, it, it is, um, the, the trend is moving up and to the right in terms of number of users who are blocking ads. Brian, any question for you there? It would seem that the trajectory for ad blocking is the same as the trajectory for mobile usage. Uh, and it's uh, interesting to see that it seems to be relatively the same percentage in developing countries versus developed countries. Um, are these two things in lockstep, do you think? Well, that's a really interesting um, question. The, the, in a moment, we'll talk a little bit about the, um, some, some major events that happened last year, but one of them was the announcement that Apple came out with that they were going to enable ad blocking in Apple's iOS 9 um, software. Um, and so up until that point, up until the point that iOS 9 enabled ad blocking, there really wasn't a whole lot of mobile capability from an ad blocking standpoint. Um, so then in, in September, October time frame, Apple announced and, and deployed this capability, but we're still seeing it being fairly um, small in terms of the percentage of ad block in mobile versus on the desktop. So I think if you're seeing correlations between the growth in mobile and ad block rates growth, that's, it's more coincidental. However, I would say in the future, I would strongly expect for the mobile ad rates to rise. Um, it's, still, it, it's, it's only been out a few months in iOS uh, 9. Uh, Samsung and Android are still working out some, some details to, to put ad blocking software in the Samsung devices um, in Android. Um, so I think that that's going to be a future trend we see, but it hasn't been incredibly prevalent yet. Thank you. Sure. Um, just looking at ad block percentages um, on a global basis, you can see here by country. Now, what I tried to, um, tr to do for the purposes of this conversation is extract some of the data that were specific to Canada, which I thought might be interesting. Um, admittedly, this is probably a year and a half or two old, so it's not the most um, uh, recent data, but it shows you that you know, the, uh, in Canada, um, the ad block rate was north of the U.S., um, somewhere in the 16 to 18% range. This happens to be looking at income segment uh, and ad block rate by in, uh, income segment. But generally, the takeaway would be that the ad block rates in Canada are consistent globally, and actually, in some cases, more so than in the US. Um, my assumption would be that if we did this math now, we would see both the US and Canada both move up, uh, up uh, to the right. I'm going to take a moment to take a step back. and think about how we got to this, this place. And some of this, this is less source point philosophy and more my own, uh, my own real opinion based on my experience the last 16, 17 years, um, having watched the development of the online advertising ecosystem. Um, so just looking back for a moment, when you think about the early days of internet advertising, 
the company that I worked for was DoubleClick. And while, yes, I have some very individual experience working there, the reason I bring it up is that DoubleClick from the early days and actually through to today in this point in time um, has been initially a pioneer in online advertising and is now an absolutely dominant force in terms of digital advertising. And from a history, from a history standpoint, when you look back at DoubleClick, and this is from almost uh, 16 years to the date, March 2, 2000, this was the statement from DoubleClick in 1990, uh, in, in 2000, sorry. And the, the thing to notice is in sort of the middle there, talking about um, DoubleClick's leadership as an innovator in improving the value of Internet advertising and keeping the Internet free for consumers. The online advertising space was founded on this principle that, yes, they were going to be a for-profit company, but what they really wanted to do, what their, their, their calling was, was to enable the proliferation of content digitally funded by advertising. And it really was based on that starting when the company was founded in 1996. That, is what they were, that was a rallying cry. And from that point on, what happened, and this is a, this is a um, diagram of uh, Internet users, I think in the millions, I guess I got that right, um, year over year. And you can see it is very much an up and to the right story. So as users um, started getting higher uh, access to, ban um, to, to Internet connections when we moved from dial-up to broadband, we became an incredibly connected society. Mobile phones as well obviously played a role in this as well. So we have more and more consumers um, you know, gravitating to the Internet. And what ended up happening, and I think the, uh, the audience here is very, very much aware of this. You probably have, have rode this through the history of, of, of media. It put an incredible amount of pressure on publisher operations. And consumers started gravitating to digital channels versus traditional channels such as print or, or radio, for example. And publishers had to adopt. They had to adapt and adopt strategies that enabled them to sustain even as their audience began to fragment from one specific channel to multiple digital channels. And with that, such grew the online advertising revenues. This is a very US-centric chart, but you can see how this is just from 2005 to 2014, the explosive growth of digital advertising revenues. And as publishers became more and more hungry to, to, to monetize these digital audiences, the, the ad experiences for consumers became, in some cases, more and more intrusive. As publishers strived to meet their revenue targets, in many cases, they would opt for more intrusive ad units, in some cases, simply more ads. I, I remember at one of the, the conferences I went to um, uh, in later years at DoubleClick, someone was presenting a case study about how they had done this incredible job for one of our publishers. And it was like a, a fully presented case study. And all they really did, they went from, adding, uh, from, from having three ads on the page to six. That was what it boiled down to. And when all else failed, it was, OK, add another ad unit, add a more intrusive ad unit. Um, and all those things uh, took away, in some cases, from the user experience. And when faced with, um, with the ability to employ or deploy ad block, you know, it sort of played a role. And this slide, this, this specific stat, is really, in my opinion, what it all comes down to, which is this is saying that in a recent survey, this was um, mid the middle of last year, I believe, uh, it's specific to the UK, but I expect the, the, the result to be similar in other regions. But nearly 60% of those surveyed had no idea 
that the advertisements that they were seeing were paying for and were correlated to their ability to access content for free. So to me, the whole situation we're in boils down to this, this sort of stat, which is that the relationship between advertising and content consumption has for the past, in essence, 20 years been an implicit one, one in which cons consumers were simply not aware, in many cases, that their eyeballs were the cash that they paid, that they paid with, to view that content for free. So in, in many cases when, again, faced with a very blunt instrument like an ad block software tool, it's easy to see why it would be very simple to just turn it on, and then my browsing experience would improve. Brian, just a point of clarification in your revenue chart. When you're talking about ad revenue, is that specifically display advertising, or does that incorporate other types like the um, sponsored content native advertising? These numbers would likely have been simply display revenue. I'd have to go back and check the source um, as to what the, the numbers actually would be if you encompassed the whole suite of, of revenues, including directly sold sponsorships and native content and video content. Okay, so when we're talking about ad blocking technology, is that strictly blocking display advertising? Uh, actually, no. When ad block tools actually, um, and a lot of people will say that the, the, the number one culprit for driving people to, to use ad block is actually video. Um, so ad block, if you install ad block plus from, from the Google Play Store, Google Chrome Store, I should say, you will no longer see pre-roll videos, for example, pre-roll being the video that appears before your content, you will no longer see pre-roll videos in YouTube, for example. So ad block works in, on display ads, video ads, um, on desktop, and, and now in mobile. The one area that it is not effective in today is in-app mobile. So for example, there is no tool that we know of today that will enable a user to block uh, the ads within Facebook, for example, if you're using the app uh, on your mobile device. Okay, thank you. Sure. So the way we think about it, ad block usage is not, you know, ad block is not the problem, and we talk about it sometimes ad nauseum. But ad block is really the symptom. The problem really is what I just described, which is the lack of explicit dialogue between publishers and consumers at scale about this value exchange. You are getting free content in return for viewing these advertisements. Um, and consumers are, are speaking loudly by deploying ad block. They're saying we want a different uh, ad experience. We're concerned in some cases about privacy, in some cases about malware. We want choice in how we are compensating you as a publisher, as a media owner, uh, for your content. Um, I talked about this already, but just very simply, the fundamentals of ad block, you install it. Once you install it, it sits between your, your browser and the content and makes decisions as to which content it is going to filter out. It does so through something called a, a, a filter list that contains well-known uh, website URLs or, or website addresses and makes decisions as to whether an ad call, a call from your browser to the Internet, is likely going to be going to an ad-related source, and then it simply filters out those advertisements. Brian, this may be upcoming uh, in your presentation, but there's a question from the audience about um, how do you track ad block usage? You know, are, what are the analytics to show that? Sure. I actually will talk a lot about, uh, not a lot about, I talk a little bit about that later on. Um, that is one of the, the sort of foundational pieces of our, uh, of our platform. 
Um, so we actually have technology. The first, actually, the first step when we engage with a publisher is to do just that, is to, to deploy an analytic solution that allows them to understand the scope um, and size of their ad block issue. And I will talk about that in a moment, and we can get into um, some, of, uh, some of the details around how we do that. Thank you. All right. Um, so looking back on 2015, um, you know, when you start a company, you're never really sure like how it's going to play out. And we started this company in, in you know April, May, June timeframe last year. Uh, we were unclear as to whether we were really you know in in a space of any meaning. We knew that there was there was something there, but what happened since then has been just um, in some cases surreal. Um, in August, um, Howard Stern, um, New York-based radio personality went on went on a, a little bit of a rant during his program. He's got three million um, you, uh, listeners. Um, and as a result, there, there was an awful lot of attention that was paid to Adblock. Um, we ended up being featured on uh, the United States program, The Today Show, with a personality by the name of Al Roker. Uh, it became a little bit surreal how, how much it was brought to the forefront. And then, the announcement I alluded to earlier, um, Apple announcing that for the first time they would enable their operating system for mobile, uh, iOS uh, 9 in this case, to support ad blocking. And up until, until that point, we even as a company were not completely sure that we would even be playing in the mobile space. But one announcement, one decision, decision from, from Apple, and all of a sudden, it became a major, major theme in the media, uh, mainstream media, not just the advertising media. Um, and then it just, it, some of these, uh, these announcements just are just staggering to think about and the impact that they will have. But in the fall, a wireless carrier in the Caribbean, Digicel, probably a carrier you may not be all that familiar with, um, but they announced that in certain countries they would be rolling out carrier level, network level ad blocking, which would enable um, basically the entire network of mobile uh, devices on that specific carrier's network to be ad blocked um, by default. Um, you know, you just can't, when you think about that, you, you try to think about it in, in the context of Canadian mobile providers or U.S. mobile providers, it's just, it's staggering. Um, and there are a number of other items that are mentioned here. Uh, Firefox announcing that they're going to implement ad blocking as part of their private browsing mode. So we, we, uh, ad blocking made it to South Park, a, a sure sign that you're, you're a part of a, a large trend. And then hardware in December, Asus announced that they'd be baking in ad blocking capabilities into their hardware products. So um, amazing. And the truth is, um, every day, and if, you, if you were to set up a Google News alert on ad blocking, as, as we have, you would be amazed at not just the number of stories that happen every day, but the significance of some of those stories. Um, one example um, I'll talk about in a moment, but in the UK, another mobile provider is now contemplating rolling out ad blocking across their entire network. So an entire audience in, in the UK is theoretically potentially going away. Um, so when we think about looking, looking ahead at the next year, there are a couple of areas of, of ad blocking that I think are important to understand. Mobile carriers, it will be really interesting to see what happens um, in, in the Caribbean. It will be interesting to see what happens in, in Europe with uh, three wireless, the company I was alluding to earlier, uh, because the, you know, the concept of net neutrality will be called into play and the government will likely get involved. Um, institutional, um, it is highly likely that workplaces and corporations will look to deploy ad blocking technologies uh, because ads bring with it a certain amount of bandwidth usage. So from a cost saving standpoint, sure, it, why not in, in, you know, deploy a, an ad block solution for your company? Uh, and then also potentially packaging with antivirus software. Um, you know, were you know, Norton antivirus to package in ad blocking the number of ad block users could rise fairly significantly in a fairly quick period of time. So 
Sorry, Brian, for the mobile carriers, it's a, a cost savings for them as well, isn't it, because of, of the bandwidth issues and um, that is directly impacting their, their cost structures. That, that's correct, and certainly that's how I think Digicel is approaching it. It is both, it, it, it can be looked at as a cost avoidance uh, uh, initiative, or you know, maybe cynically, there are opportunities to potentially generate revenues from this um, in some ways. You know, so if, and we've not seen this yet, but if I'm a wireless carrier, I could offer a consumer an ad-free experience for a specific monthly fee. And, you know, my mom, you know, <laughs> she's real concerned about her, her cell phone usage. And if she was presented with an option of $1.99 for reduced ad experience, which allows her to keep her data bills down, there's a, there's, there's a value proposition that would be appealing to a certain audience. So it, some of the business models have not yet been um, flushed out, to be honest. So, but I do think there's, there's both cost avoidance but also revenue generation that could come from it. Right. Uh, and, and then this is just from a, I, there hasn't been that much government related activity in the ad block space yet. Um, however, yesterday, the story on the left, this is another, another example where every day there is something. The UK government is now uh, kicking off an investigation slash set of discussions to try to understand the implications of ad blocking and what, if anything, needs to be done to address. Um, so I think we will see more of that um, in the future uh, because, you know, we're, in, in the U.S. especially, which I'm a, a bit more familiar with, you know, the concept of net neutrality is one that's been highly controversial in the past, and it hasn't happened yet, but if it does come to the U.S., if that dialogue does come to the U.S., it will be a very interesting uh, set of actions to, to watch play out. Um, so perhaps what we can do before I turn and talk about um, the ways in which publishers are working to solve some of these challenges, do we want to just open it up quickly for questions? Anything that has come in already? There is a question which you may be addressing in this section. It's a, the fact that publishers have offered a choice to consumers in the form of paywalls and paid premium content and that seems to have been rejected by consumers. So, uh, you know, are there other options for publishers? Uh, yeah, that's it's a great question and one that um, we'll talk about in a, in a bit. Um, certainly, um, I mean, my personal belief and our company's belief is that um, it comes down to choice. Um, and in most cases up until now, it's been there's been very little choice. It's been either pay uh, for the New York Times or, you know, you're not going to see um, content after a certain period of time. Um, you know, I kind of equate it to, if you think about um, music, because we, we make a lot of the analogies to the digital music business, but if you think about the notion of a user paying um, $10 to access one single record label's content, it probably is not particularly palatable. However, when you combine multiple record labels across multiple genres, um, it becomes much easier to fathom paying a single monthly fee for that basket of digital content, a la Spotify. And you know, our belief is that the solution has yet to be delivered to consumers that gives them adequate choice. Um, and I think we are, as a company, we're working towards that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. It's a great question. Uh, there's a second question. Uh, will in-stream native advertising and sponsored content be affected I'm assuming by ad blocking in future. In stream, yes. Um, native, potentially. I guess it really depends on the definition of native. I'll just answer it sort of quickly. What was the third type? Sponsored content? 
uh, yes, native advertising, in-stream native advertising and sponsored content? I think the short answer is yes. I think all of those, um, those types of advertising remain susceptible. The, the one, the, the piece I mentioned earlier that I think is important to note is that there are certain in-app advertising remains insulated and protected. So, for example, there's no way to block an ad um, on in the Facebook app today. Um, native advertising from a Facebook standpoint, even on desktop, ad blocking will not strip out sponsored posts, for example, in Facebook, which I'm sure you know you, many of you have seen as you scroll through your news feed. Um, ad block does work on the ads on the right side of Facebook on your desktop, for example. So you know, in, in some cases, the answer is yes, no. I, I hope that's enough of an answer uh, for right now. Yeah, I think you you're also will cover some of that in the um, this part of the presentation. Yep. So I'm gonna I'll move on for a moment here. Uh, when we think about the source point platform, for the purposes of this conversation, the source point platform represents the types of solutions that are available. Uh, for publishers, and this is how we view the world. Um, and I'm going to talk m in more in depth about all of these, but I'll just run through them quickly. Analytics, um, you know, the ability to, to, to let someone know how many users are blocking ads. Ad recovery, the ability to enable ad delivery even to a user who has ad block. Uh, messaging, providing some sort of communication with the user that starts to reestablish the value proposition between ads and content. Um, choice, providing consumers with the ability to choose how they compensate a publisher for their content. Um, content lock, this is a really important uh, trend that we're seeing. Publishers saying to a consumer, you know what, you've got ad block turned on, no more content. Um, we'll talk more about that in a moment. And subscription, so whether it's single site subscription, which looks an awful lot like a paywall, or a, a, a quote unquote web pass that gives a consumer broad access to a lot of different content with one single payment, um, that's also part of our platform. Um, we recently ran a survey which asked 150 uh, premium publishers what, mo what, what, uh, what solutions they were uh, contemplating and deploying. Um, and sort of from right to left in this case, uh, most popular is ad recovery. And this is simply, I, you know, turn the ads back on. How do we just very simply make sure that if someone comes to our site and they're using an ad blocker, that they still are seeing an ad. Um, it's a fairly aggressive approach. Um, however, in some cases, we are seeing publishers um, comfortable with starting um, to, to go down that path. And we're working with publishers, frankly, who have done it in a way that's, I think, um, thoughtful and careful, an altered ad experience, maybe less ads than they would have seen if they didn't have uh, ad block turned on. Uh, the second is messaging. Again, engaging the consumer, explaining the impact of, of that ad block is having on their site, uh, and trying to sort of push them in the right direction through that. Um, there's less commitment around this at this point, but content locking um, is another solution that is growing in popularity. We've seen experiments in the U.S. and the in the U.K. specifically, um, where publishers are are coming forward and, and having that very difficult conversation with a consumer that you know you, the advertising is how we fund this site, and unless you're willing to view advertising or or pay us in another way, we're unfortunately not going to be able to provide you with the content. Um, and last, I think as the the um, uh, the, the uh, participant had mentioned in the question, less popular is subscription, and a smaller percentage of publishers are going down that path. There are still a number of publishers who are, and, and frankly, as a company, we're bullish on this as a, as a, 
is an offering that we will bring to market, but fewer are sold that this is going to be the, the solution for them. Um, before I move on, any questions on the specific takeaways from, from the publisher survey? I think it's fine, Brian. I'll just mention that we've got uh, 18 minutes left in the session. Cool. Very good. Um, so talking specifically about the products that we offer, uh, we mentioned earlier analytics. Uh, analytics that we, we deploy for our publishers simply allows them to understand what percentage of users on their site are coming there with Adblock turned on. Um, in lots of cases, they look at it by, um, by property. So if you're working with a very large media company, they will be able to see by property A, B, or C which properties have a greater percentage of users blocking ads. Uh, in some cases, we've, we've sat down with major media companies to review their analytics, and they are simply um, shocked, um, like jaws hanging open, when they learn that their large property has 35 or 40 percent of their users blocking ads. It's, it's quite, um, quite shocking at certain times. Um, revenue protection, this is, again, the ability to simply turn the ads back on, uh, to, to put it simply, which is uh, working with publishers to re-enable uh, or re-deliver the ads, um, either the same ads or different ads, that were blocked uh, and ensuring that the ad block user actually does see some sort of advertising uh, and thus is able to be um, monetized, if you will. Uh, content lock and messaging. Um, let me see if I have a good, yeah, this is a, an example of content locking. And this is where a publisher is saying, you know, you have a couple of different choices. Uh, you either disable your ad block or you subscribe, and simply that is it. And you know, this is uh, an area that we would call um, hard messaging. Content locking is something that is fairly aggressive. Uh, another example of messaging here is what we would call soft messaging. Here a publisher is basically saying, you know, please turn off your ad blocker. You could still access the content, but can you do us a favor and turn it off? Um, what we have found and what we have heard from publishers that we work with is that from a percentage standpoint, the effectiveness of this soft messaging, the messaging that lacks teeth, if you will, is fairly low in the 1% to 2% range of users actually turning off the ad block uh, software as a result, whereas content locking can deliver somewhere in the 30 to 40% effectiveness range. So those are some very important numbers to keep in mind if anyone on the call is plotting their own strategy um, with respect to ad blocking. Uh, the difference between soft messaging and hard messaging or content locking is, is something you should definitely consider. Brian, we have a question about the ad blocking detection. Uh, again, is that only available through a technology like SourcePoint or is there another way of determining that? We've heard from some customers that they've been able to work within their existing analytics suite, be that Google Analytics or Omniture. Um, I think those are the two that we've heard about, you know, people trying to, to figure out ways to do it. Um, you know, the analytics, um, it, it's, it's possible. I would urge anyone contemplating going down that path to think about what they're intending to use the data for. And, and again, I'm not selling the SourcePoint platform, um, but if you are planning on making very um, important business decisions based on that data, meaning if you're thinking about cutting off content to certain users based on that, that signal you're getting from Google Analytics or Omniture, you really want to make sure that, that is, um, it's bulletproof because the risk of false positives could have, you know, significant implications on the relationship with the user as well as on revenue, obviously. So, um, but that's certainly, uh, I, from, we've heard of some people deploying um, their, own, um, their own sort of sensing technology, if you will. 
We have a great question about the user experience. Can you disable your ad block on um, uh, iOS 9 if it's included in OS? Yeah, it's actually a, that's an amazing question because what I, what Apple did they didn't they didn't for example bundle in ad blocking um, software by default. Ad blocking was included as part of the package called I think it's called content blocking, and it needs to be turned on by the user. And once that capability is turned on, it's in the systems settings within iOS 9. You then need to install an ad blocking application, which then serves as the the ad block, uh, the, the ad block software. If that if that helps explain. Now there have been recent talks about Samsung doing something a bit more aggressive in bundling ad block software with their phones. But I don't think we've yet to see those initiatives play themselves out. Does that is that uh, Zach? Does that answer the question? Cool. Thank you, Zach. My pleasure. Um, so that's the messaging piece. Again, for anyone contemplating deploying any sort of uh, solution right now, it's a really important point to think about whether you're going to do soft messaging or or a harder more uh, you know, content locking type of thing. Um, and value exchange, you know, this is really, uh, from our perspective, this is, this is where it gets really exciting, is, you know, can, as the publisher community, can we start providing optionality to consumers so they can decide how they compensate the publisher? And it could be one of there are so many different ways to do it, creative ways to do it, whether it's um, opting in for the traditional ad experience and turning off their ad blocker, or maybe an altered ad experience where you watch a single video of your category choice uh, in exchange for uh, you know free content for a period of time, single site subscription or the the web pass. This to me is is where um, where what we're doing sort of transcends ad tech and actually just starts to do a lot of good for um, the digital world as we know it. And it's honestly one of the things I'm most excited about. Um, and the last piece I'll talk about is just, um, and it's not so much, uh, again, I keep saying it's not, not really from a sales pitch standpoint, but a lot of what's happening in the ad block space is really very new and unchartered uh, territory for both publishers as well as um, the vendors in the space, and you know, people, uh, consultative services, uh, partnership, it's really important. We spend a lot of time talking with publishers about their unique individual strategies. Um, you know, there's not really a, a one-size-fits-all approach to tackling some of the stuff I talked about. Um, it, we've seen publishers use um, some of their brand assets, for example, in messaging to consumers. Um, the Washington Post ran this amazing uh, experiment where they used um, elements of um, uh, Watergate and All the President's Men, the, the, the film, in their ad blocking messaging. It was ultimately not effective, but that's, you know, a lot of that um, came down to implementation. But just partnership, really important. Uh, we're all working together to figure out the best strategies and work to, to create something that is both in the interest of publishers and in the interest of consumers. So that's the, uh, the last uh, piece of, uh, of guidance I will give to you. Um, and with that, I would love to open it up to any additional questions, comments, anything else we can, we can talk to in these last remaining minutes. If you have any questions, please uh, type them into the question box, and we can uh, work to get those answered for you. Uh, in the meantime, Brian, uh, you know, you've talked quite a bit about, as you, as you call it, the symptom of ad blocking, in res but, but we haven't really touched on the cause of it, which is essentially bad ads and bad user experience, and this is a reaction to it. So is there something that can be done in working with advertisers to improve that user experience? Yeah, I actually think you're, um, you, you hit on a great point. Uh, the symptom certainly is ad, blo uh, is ad blocking, but one of the problems is certainly um, 
the advertising experience has been less than stellar. So we're actually doing some outreach with advertisers, actually, to see if we can figure out um, if there's any sort of work that could be done from a creative standpoint to make ads less intrusive and more favorable uh, to users. 100%. That is, that is actually a process that is ongoing. The IAB is working on creating a set of standards as well to sort of drive creative in the right way. Um, because ultimately, that has been an issue up until, uh, up until now. And clearly, ad quality has driven consumers in that direction. It's a great point. Another question, certainly a, a segment of the Magazines Canada membership um, would not perhaps have the, um, the resources to be able to take on a kind of technology like SharePoint. Uh, what do you, sorry, SourcePoint, um, what would you recommend as some basic steps that publishers can take to help address this issue without the technology? Um, I think it's, it's actually a challenging uh, problem to solve without technology, frankly, just because you know, you're talking about digital transactions that are not face-to-face -face or on the phone. But, I, I mean, I would look at your, your ad experience as a publisher, ensure that you're being respectful of your users. And I, I assume um, most of you, if not all of you, are in some, some, some way. But I also suspect you've been under pressure, as all publishers have from a revenue perspective. You all have numbers to hit. And in, you know, in cases like that, sometimes ads are the easiest way to sort of you know, ratchet up the revenue. It, it's a balance. Um, you know, try to um, work to, to create ad experiences that are more in line with your consumers' uh, tastes. You could certainly do consumer surveys to get a sense um, as to what they deem to be acceptable from an advertising standpoint, uh, depending on the size of the publication. If you have uh, the ability or the, the resources to do a, a small focus group, there might be benefit in understanding more of your consumer. I mean, all of this is about uh, creating dialogue with consumers. Our technology allows publishers to do that at scale, but there are plenty of ways that you can do so, even in sort of low-tech fashion, if you will. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we have a, a number of questions that have come in. Um, how does ad recovery work? Are consumers upset when the ad block doesn't work? Are ad blockers finding ways around that? Oh, amazing question. Zach is on fire. Um, so <laughs> the, the, um, basically, it, it really does depend. As I mentioned, with ad recovery, frequently what happens is that publishers decide to turn the ads back on in a different way. If they started off with 12 ads on the page, they might choose to only deliver three ads on the page uh, from a recovery standpoint. Uh, in other cases, the units that they recover are, are more gracefully integrated into the site, weaved in in a more native type fashion. Um, that said, there are cases where users do complain. And there are message boards out there in which commu uh, ad block community members will voice concern about seeing ads, even with ad block turned on, on a specific site. And ad blockers will sometimes find ways around it. Um, that is really one of the, ch to me, the largest challenge that publishers will face who try to do this th themselves is that there's that community element of working developing solutions in this sort of environment that's really tricky to ensure persistent messaging and persistent ad delivery. And one thing to mention, this is really important, ad blocking has the ability to impact the messages you display to consumers as well, not just ads. So let's say you wanted to implement a message to, to those using ad block that said, you know, please take down your ad blocker. Well, guess what? The ad block software has the ability to block that as well. So, you know, there's a little bit of cat and mouse that happens here. Um, and, um, you know, I think we'll see a lot of publishers go at it themselves. Um, 
our individual perspective, as you would probably guess, is that we think that enterprise-grade technology is really the solution. But um, yeah, great question, Zach. Here's another question about the long reach of ad blockers. Does, does it also uh, work in blocking ads within e-newsletters that have content articles, you know, a significant newsletter as opposed to an ad newsletter? You know, I have to say that I don't know the answer to that question. So I, I assume the question is, if, if you get an email newsletter in your inbox, will the ad be blocked? Yes, the ad within the e-newsletter. My, my, the short answer is going to be I believe it would be because the, the, the way it works, it, it, it sort of looks at your network calls going out from your computer, if you will, to the Internet. And as long as those, um, those ad calls are still going out through your computer, it would theoretically block that as well. So I think the answer is going to be yes, but I'd have to really confirm. Okay. Uh, there's a question about whether it's possible to customize the ads being served to a selection of users. So, um, you know, certain users could fill out a checklist saying uh, they'll they'll look at display ads, but they don't want in interstitials or pop-ups. Um, is is that within the realm of possibility? Uh, yes. It's actually one of the things that we're working on. It, it, we're, we call it um, ad preferences. Um, so the ability and this is again. This is a um, this is a bit of a I don't, I don't want to call it blue sky or pie in the sky kind of thought. We, we've got plans down this road, but our our plan is to build a set of um, like a control panel that has a global set of ad preferences, such that consumers would be able to say, I'm accepting of this sort of creative, this sort of ad, of this specific advertiser or this category of advertiser, but not these other forms of advertisement. So absolutely, um, that is something that we're actually uh, building. Okay, I think uh, our time is approaching where we need to wrap this up. Uh, I'd like to offer our thanks to Brian Kane for so, so graciously bringing his time and expert insights to the webinar today. I think it's been a fabulous discussion and an area that um, certainly has brought a kind of chilling effect <laughs> to, to publishers and the, the basic equation that we've always operated on for our business model. Um, it's exciting to see the promotion of this idea of having a dialogue with, with our readers, our, our online users, about what that exchange of value is and how significant it is to have the advertising revenues to support the creation of great content. I know particularly for Magazines Canada members, um, you, you know, the, the cultural publications, uh, it's not a question of this ad revenue contributing to uh, a significant portion of their revenues, but every little bit counts. I think it, it probably leaves the option of ha at least having that discussion uh, of this is how you show your support for our publication by um, uh, taking the advertising in as well as the great content. Um, I have a, a few things to uh, plug here for you because if you thought that uh, this was a great webinar, <laughs> uh, we continue on in the tradition and uh, have one upcoming at the end of March. Uh, be sure to check out Magazine Media Brands in the Digital Age. We have uh, a stellar panel and uh, we'll be discussing this on March 31st, so sign up takes place on the Magazines Canada website. Um, I'd also like to remind you to save the date that there is a State of the Magazine Nation uh, upcoming April 28th. You can put that in your calendars. Um, what advertisers want? Well, don't we want to know that? That's a fabulous topic. And finally, uh, we'd like to say thank you to uh, the sponsors of the Ad Webinar Series who have made this possible. Great content uh, at no charge. Um, Ontario Media Development Corporation. And for more information, you can go to magazinescanada.ca or email magazinescanada. And the uh, actual presentation will be available on the site for download next week. Uh, so you can uh, download it and share with uh, your colleagues in your office uh, and start 
to foster this conversation, this very important conversation within the magazine Canada's uh, Canadian magazine industry. Uh, again, thank you very much, Brian, and thanks everyone else for participating. Hey, I'm sorry. There's one thing. Um, if anyone, ha I, I realize I didn't put my email address in the slides, but if anyone has questions or follow-up stuff, uh, it's Brian at SourcePoint.com. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, anyone might have. Thank you again. All right. Thank you guys.